We are here today to talk just a little bit about Christian nationalism, which is something that you see mentioned a lot on social media, in books, book reviews, political reporting, even picking up on that with election season uh, coming on. Maybe we should start with what is it? Because there's been a lot of debate over what constitutes Christian nationalism. Anybody want to take a stab at what is Christian nationalism? Dr. Reichen. Well, I was going to ask Bob Thune to do it because he knows more about politics probably than, than I, I did. Well, I did read, you know, Perry and Whitehead came out with a book last year that it, it, sociologically trying to define this right. term. So I think part of the challenge is there's a narrower definition and a broader definition. They were trying to arrive at how would you describe this? And basically the way they, the, the definition they land on is it's a fusing of Christian identity and national identity in ways that, that most of us would find problematic. Um, so that's one, one way to understand Christian nationalism is just my identity as a Christian, my identity as a citizen of my nation getting conflated in ways that are unbiblical. Okay. You want to elaborate on that? Well, nationalism has a whole history to it, and there's, which is centuries long, a rise in nation states and how people identify with the people of their nation. For me, the term Christian nationalism seems very recent. I, I yeah. can't re really remember hearing it more than sort of five years ago. Um, and it came in at a time when people weren't really talking about nationalism at all, but all of a sudden it's nationalism and it's Christian nationalism. So one distinction I would make is between nationalism and patriotism. For me, nationalism connotes something where the nation is elevated to a place that is perhaps even godlike, has an idolatrous uh, connection, whereas patriotism is a, is a love of country that can be a virtuous thing. So when I hear the term nationalism, I put it more over in this non-virtuous category in contrast to patriotism. I, I might add that there's, I think, contrasting with globalism can be helpful too. Because if you think about what's the opposite of nationalism, it's sort of like yeah, the idea of I'm a global citizen of nowhere. So I think some of the people that would say nationalism isn't always a bad term would say, well, we are a citizen of a nation. And so there is an appropriate kind of patriotism and place in the world compared to sort of a, a citizen of nowhere. Yeah, I think it also has to do with the level of our affection. And you mentioned idolatry. You know, Jesus says, anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Uh, he's used hate in other places. If anyone doesn't even hate his own life, he's not advocating hatred. It's a hierarchy of loyalties, hierarchy of affections. And I think the sense I get with Christian nationalism is that that loyalty to country has taken too high a place in that person's uh, hierarchy of affections. I was going to ask you a question, Lincoln, which is when you think about what can be healthy in patriotism, mm -hmm. what, what comes to mind? Do you think of yourself as a patriotic person, patriotic for the United States? What, uh, what does that look like in the life of a believer? You and I come out of a very similar ecclesiastical tradition where our people have tended to be patriotic, certainly in their personal and social lives, but they've also wanted to be very careful not to bring that into church. So you know, in, in our tradition, there are even arguments, should there be accoutrements of our country's symbolism in our church buildings, and especially in, our, uh, in the meeting hall where we, where we gather uh, for worship. And, and that reflects people in our tradition trying to be really careful about too closely mixing America and our commitment to Christ and our practice as the church and our worship of God. So I, 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 I want to encourage patriotism in my congregation in their personal lives. I want them to care about their country. I want them to care about their fellow citizens. I want, to, uh, I want to, uh, them to care about their country's conduct in relation to the other countries of the world. Uh, we need to be engaged in that way. And it's, and it's interesting, there's a lot of material on that topic in the New Testament. Uh, Titus 3, the whole chapter is really about Christian conduct in the society and in the culture. And when you think about that, that's Crete. The Cretans had a real chip on their shoulder about the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire had come in and conquered their territory. And Paul's 
instructions to them are all about having a constructive engagement with the society, caring about the well-being of all people, being good citizens, respecting authority, when they had a natural tendency not to want to do that. And so I, I, I got interested in this. Uh, I was teaching a course and I had to look at the question of helping Christians think through what is the Bible teaches about the way we engage with culture. And it, it struck me that there is actually a lot in the New Testament that gives direct um, command and counsel to Christians on how they conduct themselves in this way. I, w one thing I'll add to what you have said about Christian, and I, I, I was going to throw in the global thing because I, do, I think that's big. A lot of times when you see someone either adopt something like a Christian nationalist label or someone accuse someone of being a Christian nationalist, a lot of times immigration policy is behind that, and behind that is a concern with globalism. And so it, I, I do think we are in an interesting moment. I think the Christian nationalism discussion reminds me a lot of the old theonomy discussion in the 1970s and 80s, but it's a very different sociological situation. 70s and 80s, you have the rise of sort of social conservatives in the Republican Party, the, the rise of the influence of evangelicalism in politics. Carter is elected and one of the major magazines does the Year of the Evangelical and all this kind of stuff. Within that movement, the Reconstruction movement, the Theonomy movement is sort of part of that right wing wave that's growing up, wanting to influence the culture with Christian uh, virtues, ideals, principles, laws, etc. Today, the Christian nationalism group, I really think, represents a sense of the loss of influence in culture. It, 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 re it represents a tiny, tiny, politically uninfluential group. I mean, you know, what, what governor, senator, congressman is out there advocating for anything like Christian nationalism or who would be open to that. You, you remember when the, when the laws were being debated in Uganda re regarding LGBTQIA rights, even the most conservative members of uh, the U.S. Congress would not touch it at all. And, and, and so w what we're seeing now is a discussion about Christian nationalism that has, there's no possibility of any real public effect on it in, in terms of public policy, government, et cetera. Who are the people that are advocating for it that are actually involved in government? And that, to me, it, I, I think that means that, that with, with, with at least some people that will utilize the label, they're more concerned with building a subculture within the church that, uh, th that uh, advocates for certain ideals and excludes other people that don't advocate for those ideals rather than actually influencing the way we operate as a commonwealth, as a nation, as a republic. So I do think the sociological situations are really, really different from the 1970s and 80s and the rise of the evangelical influence. I think a lot of this is the fallout from the 2016 election when the 81% white evangelical thing, that just became a meme everywhere. And some of this is sort of like payback. <laughs> you know, Christian, Christian nationalism has become the, 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 the sort of the bully boy uh, to beat up on uh, be, because of, of that kind of concern. You've already articulated a view of Christian nationalism that warns against certain things. What, what things are problematic what things are potentially helpful under that label? I wonder, I'm interested in a, in a question connected to that based on what you just said, like, which is, I think as we think about what is, what, what kind of societal influence is it okay for Christians to want? Because what I sense in, in the background of this conversation is there's sort of an implicit enlightenment liberalism that says, keep your faith yes. private in the public square, yes. don't try to advocate for anything. And, and some, you're right that the, the moment is different. And so some of what people are pushing back against is, is it okay for me to advocate for a public policy position on an issue that I, I feel like is connected to the Christian worldview? And I think that's the place where things get a little sticky right now. So I'm curious how you guys would talk about the, the connection between our convictions about God and Christ and the scriptures, and then how that should lead us to involve ourselves in public that's policy. That's a great question. Well, I think one of it, I just uh, preaching through the gospel of Mark and I'm at, uh, I just dealt with uh, paying taxes to Caesar. and. Uh, 
um, I knew we were having this discussion coming up. I was reading about it, thinking about it. So I added an additional page of notes and I compared Christ's kingdom and the way it advances versus the kingdoms of the world and the way they advance. And I compared John 18, where Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. Uh, but then in John 12, 24, he says, unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so Christ's kingdom advances by its servants dying. Uh, the kingdoms of this world advance by killing or threatening to kill, you know, the power of the sword, yeah. the opponent. So the question is, how are opponents and opposition, opposing views dealt with? And for us, we seek to persuade, uh, we seek to exemplify godliness, we seek to pray for people, be willing to lay down our lives. The government uses the sword. It's what it's designed to do. So I'm uncomfortable with the marrying of those two together. But that doesn't help me much if I'm a Christian who's running for office or who's on the school board or who's on the city council. So I think that's where the question gets interesting to me is there's a lot of people in our churches that can keep those two worlds relatively separate, but there are many who can't. And so that, that's, that, that's where it becomes interesting is what, taking that a step further, Andy, what would you say to someone who does have a responsibility to instantiate public policy yeah. in some way? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, we have a, a, a church member that's gone on to a, 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 a circuit Supreme Court track. He's heading perhaps toward very high level, maybe even Supreme Court ultimately has a desire to do that. And he's going to be rendering verdicts on cases based out of his Christian convictions. But he also knows that the surrounding culture doesn't support that. So it's challenging. That's the salt and light aspect. And so you argue. You know, you, you uh, defend, you put your views forward, but we're going to get, we're seeing increasingly outvoted. And the thing that's hard with the LGBT aspect and other things is it's, it seems to be um, militarized almost and, and you, know, you lose your job if you don't sign up with these things. And that's the challenge. What I like about the kingdom framing is it reminds us that we have a higher citizenship, which is more important than our, our earthly citizenship. But the earthly is also important. And I think we learn this both from um, church history and we also learn it from learning from our brothers and sisters around the world. So if you look at church history, for example, the kinds of writing that Calvin and the other reformers did at, in the preambles of the things that they were publishing, they often emphasized the fact that as reformers, they were loyal citizens of the, the kingdoms that they participated in in an earthly sense. They weren't seditious or subversive in that sense. They were for the people of their place. And Calvin felt very deeply for this, you know, with respect to the French and also with the Swiss. So there's a, there's a legacy and a tradition of recognizing there's an appropriate love of people that is part of our kingdom citizenship in this earthly context. And it helps me to frame things um, internationally as well, because when I, I travel around the world and I see, for example, the way that the church in China wants to emphasize, we are loyal citizens. Uh, we, we are for the Chinese people, even though we do have this higher loyalty and we're going to, our, our loyalty to God is going to be the ultimate loyal, loyalty for us. Within that higher loyalty, we also have an affection, a neighborliness, an appropriate patriotism, I would say. So I think we, there are some examples that we can draw on that can probably really help us in our present time and place uh, in the United States. Can I ask you a question about that? One word that's in my mind is stewardship. You know, I was, I'm watching a documentary on the Civil War just past the Gettysburg Address, government of the people, by the people, for the people. This is what's unique. Um, and and a, a city on a hill, a, you know. How would you look, uh, Philip, at the issue of stewardship, that Christians have a stewardship toward our nation? Yeah, so uh, stewardship is a good, good category for that. And I think um, it's particularly important to steward power and privilege well. And, um, you know, one, one example I think of is Samuel Rutherford, who had a big influence even on our constitutional democracy through some of his, his writings. He reflected on how the church, particularly in the Presbyterian and Puritan tradition, had engaged with the pursuit of political power in England and with a lot of regret because it had, uh, it had led to regicide, it had had very harmful effects. And he reflected, he said, we were like lions and we should have been like lambs. Mm. And there was something about the character of Christ that needed to be lived out in political engagement. 
And he wanted to see that reflected not just personally, but communally in how the Christian church was engaging its political context. So part of the stewardship, I think, is drawing on the right images and metaphors from scripture that inform our, our engagement. And I agree with Bob, like there's gotta be some place that you live out your Christian convictions publicly, not just privately, um, but with this higher citizenship in mind. Well, and I think one of the things that, that's challenging is no one's going to disagree with you about loving our neighbors and loving our country and loving our people, our community and our place. Where it gets challenging is when I'm opposing something, though, like LGBTQ rights or something where, where it feels like now I'm a Christian and I have to take a stance of opposition. Yes. That feels different right now than it might have 30 or 40 years ago when there was a little more of a general sense in the culture that, yeah, it's OK, we disagree on stuff. It feels like now that's the place where Christians feel pressed is okay, what if I disagree with my neighbor about what justice looks like in society or what a good policy is to go forward Just with? reading, uh, you know, I'm from Boston originally, so I still, still get electronic uh, subscription to the Boston Globe. And just a couple of days ago, a story on the public school system rolling out their sex ed program, K through 12. Yeah. What they're doing K through three, what they're doing four through, I'm like, I'm, are they out of their minds? And if I live in that state, I mean, you know, and they said they were open all summer to push back. They got all kinds of pushback, but they're going to do what they're going to do. And there's that, that authority. And at that point, you know, so that would be a, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's like, what do we do when the, the government schools are forcing this stuff? And they say, look, you can take your kids out for those classes, but you got to be on it. You don't know when it's going to happen. It's problematic. I think those are the kinds of moments where this yeah. conversation gets challenging. And as a, as a pastor, if a, if a legislator comes to me and says, can I act on my Christian convictions about what a man and a woman is when I'm doing, I'm going to say, yes, you may. Now, I, I do think one of the tricks is the difference between must and may. Uh, that's, I think we have, to, we have to think about the doctrine of the civil magistrate. Almost all of our confessions, Baptist, Presbyterian, and otherwise, have a doctrine of the civil magistrate. And interestingly, if you look at that doctrine of the civil magistrate in, say, the 17th century in our tradition, it's different from the doctrine of the civil magistrate in the 18th century. And I think it's, it's really good for if guys are just getting into this discussion, go back and read some about the broader reform tradition on the civil magistrate from the 16th to 17th century. There's a move from state churches, established churches, to ecclesiastical voluntarism, which has a big impact on how they view the relationship of church and society. So pastors need to know a little bit about that. They also need to consider the doctrine of Christian liberty. Because as pastors, I can't tell people to do what the Bible doesn't tell them to do. And in some of these areas, there's not a clear answer. But there are areas where I can say, yes, you may pursue this particular thing. I can't tell you you must, but you may. And so I want to, and, and I've had politicians come and say, would you, would you quietly pray with me as I think through how to act with integrity, how to act in accordance with our laws, but also how to act in accordance with my Christian principles. I'm not trying to wave my flag about this. I'm just trying to be faithful. Would you pray with me about that? And as a pastor, we need to be ready to do that with all of our people that are involved, and especially at the local level. People underplay the, the power of the local influence of politics. That's it, you know, the, 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 the saying used to be that all politics is local, and I, we overlook how important and influential that is. So when you have people in local politics, whether it's the school board or, or the planning commission, that's a, that, what a wonderful opportunity to advise and counsel and encourage Christian members of our congregation. So I, I do think we have to think about Christian liberty. And um, yeah, a question just about the change. Do you think the 30 years war, the, the Christians fighting Christians on, you know, was influential in leading to the end of a state sponsored church? I, I think that uh, in the in the 17th century, reformed folks uh, who who were you know outside of the Lutheran world, broadly reformed people were running the world in in Western Europe, realized they were killing one another, and uh, they they said you know this is not working. There has to be a way that there can be liberty of conscience. Uh, where there can be freedom of religion, and when, where they can, there can be established toleration for a, d a diversity of, of, uh, of religious, um, you know, whether bodies or whatever within our, 
uh, within our countries. And, uh, and, and that's, the, that, that's the stuff out of which the American political experiment grows. Because you, you look at the people that left England in the 17th century and came to America, uh, they were right out of the milieu of the Westminster Confession of Faith and right after the great ejection in 1662 from the Church of England, and then they're coming to the colonies. And people that would have been on opposite sides of things suddenly become allies in the United States. So Baptists and Presbyterians. 30 years war yeah. ending right around that time yeah. too. And it's like, I think from then on, I don't think there were state-sponsored churches right. at all. Yeah. So, so I, that factors into this discussion about how you figure out how to relate to society. And I do think when it comes down to practical questions, there are people that are doing good thinking about this. Um, there has, everybody knows in the last 10 years, everybody's all on the Herman Bovink bandwagon. Everybody's reading Bovink. Well, Bovink is trying to think through this in his own culture. How, how do I, as a traditional Bible-believing Calvinist, counsel people to engage in the, in the public spheres of life in, a plural, in an, an increasingly secularizing and pluralizing society. That's the whole project of neo-Calvinism. So if you want to think well about this, you'd probably be wise to pick up some neo-Calvinistic literature. Corey Brock and Grace Utanto have written a wonderful little introduction to neo-Calvinism that has a whole section on politics. And that would be a great Thing to think through about how a Christian can engage as a Christian principially in a pluralistic society. That's the whole thing that neo-Calvinism is trying to think through. So I think, think about our Christian view of how we relate to the civil magistrate, think about Christian liberty, and then think about how do we do this in a pluralistic society? Because a lot of the material that we look back to from our heroes is written from a time when it was not a pluralistic society. There was an established uh, church. And that's a different dynamic for how you tell a Christian how to engage. You, you were talking about China. I had the same thought in, in the early 1990s. I'm teaching in Jackson. I had these guys that are very influenced by Christian Reconstructionism. They're, you know, they're quoting Greg Bonson that every Christian must personally advocate for the application of the civil laws of Moses to the nation state. And I'm thinking, I'm looking out in my class and I'm seeing a Chinese student. And I'm going, Okay, how does he do that? Even if he wanted to do that, how does he do that? You know, and so it's good to realize that Christians around the world are in very, very different political situations. And they've got different calculations to make in those different political situations. So I, I, do, I, I do think, I think we can actually sketch out basic Christian principles and still be left, Bob, saying, yeah, but I need some direction on what to do in this situation. Well, and I'm curious yeah. about that may and must. That's yeah. really helpful. But I'm wondering, so, you know, in our city, one of the obviously big questions has to do with gender identity laws yes. and school systems trying to say, you know, yeah. can, we cal can we call boys yeah. boys and girls girls or not? And so when a, when a Christian has to make a decision of, must we yeah. advocate for a certain, yeah. because of our convictions yes. about creation, right? Yeah. That certainly I'm free to, you know, influence in one direction. But I think the question is when it comes to loving my neighbor, What's my responsibility to the kids across the street right. as a citizen of a, of a pluralistic city? That's right. But the, the question being asked is a moral and ethical question, and that, yeah. that gets a little So sticky. there's another category here. So there's the may and the must, but there are also judgment calls that you make about the best way to advocate for something and what the best policy is. And those are the kinds of things that people of goodwill that may even agree on moral principles, they may disagree about what's the best legislation, what's the right. most persuasive way to advocate for this. So there, there's another area of judgment call and one of the, I think, tough things in a lot of the political discussions is I may have biblical principles that inform the judgment call I'm making about how to engage a particular political issue. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that because I have those principles behind it, that my judgment call about how to pursue this in the public square is of the same level of certainty and advocacy. So That's I think true. holding, just, uh, just recognizing there's a difference between the principles that inform something and the judgment call I'm making about how to advocate for those. And then another thing I'd add to the list with, with conscience, there's the position that we have on a public issue, which may be moral and maybe a moral imperative. There's also the posture that we bring to how we relate to people as we advocate for that position. And I think in a lot of the political discussions we've had in the Christian community and evangelical communities, we've been much more focused on the position than we have been reflective on 
the spirit fruit virtues mm -hmm. that we bring to our posture for how we engage the issues. And I think if you read the New Testament, the posture is as important to Jesus as the position is. And they are both part of embodying Christian witness yeah. in the political sphere. Yeah, you know, it's just glowing in my mind right now. It's just chapter after chapter of the book of Daniel. For example, in Daniel 4, when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream that involves the stripping of his power, like a tree being stripped of its branches and all these birds and beasts fleeing from out from under, a picture of an empire that's under uh, Nebuchadnezzar's shade, and he's stripped and you know, he's turned into insane person. Daniel's first reaction when he understood the dream is, I wish this were spoken of your enemies. You know, there's mm. a kindness to him. Mm. They seem to have a friendship. He doesn't have it with Belshazzar. He has zero respect for Belshazzar. He actually does nothing but rebuke him. You knew what God did to your grandfather and look at you. So here's the judgment. This very night your soul is going to be required of you. But with Nebuchadnezzar, he said, he said, be pleased, O king, to accept my advice. Renounce your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. He's got that advo advocacy role, and it seems like he has a hearing. I also wonder, this is speculative, how does that power vacuum not get filled by somebody? This is the Babylonian Empire, and this guy is crazy for seven years, and his kingdom is his at the end of the seven years. Where were, where were the claimants to the throne? I wonder if Daniel kept the thing running for a while because he knew Nebuchadnezzar's coming back. But that speaks of a kindness and a relationship, but a willingness to speak boldly to power, renounce your sins and your wickedness. And that's powerful. That's a great example really of both the position really and good. the posture. Really good. And, and by the way, I do think not only the New Testament epistles, but the minor prophets and especially Daniel are meant to inform us in the kind of social and political situation that we're in now as how do you stay a faithful follower of the one true and living God? How do, how, how, do you, how do you stay a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ when all of this crazy stuff is going around you politically, socially, culturally? They're there to help us. And one more thing in Daniel 7, you know, you get the four beasts coming up out of the sea. And the fourth beast is given power to wage war against the saints and defeat them. But the saints are going to get the kingdom in the end. So I think there's just a, a, a realism to know we're going to get defeated. We're not the movers and shakers often. We are the moved and shaken. But in the end, the meek will inherit the earth. So I want that es eschatology kind of thing comes in. We win by losing. So, Bob, you've been putting a lot of questions out here. I've been able to tell if they're rhetorical <laughs> questions or not. No, so no. I thought I thought I thought you There's probably not. have some like <laughs> answers that you haven't shared yet. No, they're real questions. I'm very intrigued by the conversation. I think the the questions I have relate to, you know, what you just said is true. And I think as Christians, our posture has to always be we if we read the New Testament and we read the Old Testament, we read the whole Bible, okay, God's people are often oppressed, often opposed. That's our lot. However, we do, we are, if we think back even to the founding of America, we, we do still have a responsibility to try to do the best to instantiate justice and create a society where our neighbors can flourish. And that seems to me to be the sticking point because the, the falling back to the, hey, Christians are often oppressed and opposed, I think we have to have that as a starting point. Sure. But I'm more intrigued by, but what is our responsibility in a pluralistic, democratic republic? What is our responsibility as Christians for the prospering of the nation, the, the uh, influencing of laws and policy. Those seem to be the questions that lie underneath the Christian nationalism conversation more because people I do, I do think see, well, we can't just be passive and say, well, who cares where the society goes? We do have a responsibility. And the questions of how to hold that responsibility seem to lie at the heart here. Yeah, I wonder also, as I just quickly walk through, Daniel 1, maintain your purity. Uh, Daniel 2, uh, seek God's insight for the moment and the hour as, as he's, Nebuchadnezzar wants to kill all the advisors because they can't tell the dream. Daniel 3, um, say no to I open wicked commands. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, re re refuse when you have to. Just talked about Daniel 4. Daniel 5, prophetic moment, this thing's over, knowing that these kingdoms are going to end. Daniel 6, there's, there, he's the third highest ruler in the kingdom. He's kind of running the place but he won't give up on his quiet time, his daily quiet time. All the way up to Daniel 9, pray, the prayer life. So you got personal holiness, you got prayer, you got eschatology, big picture, you got the empires, there's so much in that. So it's not like where God's left us as orphans, we don't know what to do. There's, there's actually all of those answers. Say no when you must, 
but be submissive. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, think about this. They are commanded by Nebuchadnezzar to come out of the fiery furnace, the most unenforceable law ever given in history. Make us. Send someone in here to get us. Who could come in? They're going to get ignited, all right? <laughs> but they didn't do that. They were submissive. They came out. It was not an, a, in a moral command. They came out when they were commanded to come out. There's so much in that book that gives, I think, instruction. Well, that's helpful. But, I, Lee, you mentioned Bavink, and I think that's yeah. where I'm intrigued is all our historical examples, of many of them are monarchies. It's not pluralistic that's democracy. That's and so the, the, I think it is a different question. If, you know, if I'm in a monarchy, it's like, well, I, you know, my job is either to resist the evil of the king or pray for the good of the king. But when, as a citizen, I have democratic responsibility, that's where I think there's, there are some new questions here or some, maybe not new, but in, you know, in the last 100 or 200 years, they're being asked for the first time. And I, look, I think that is the appeal whether it was Christian Reconstructionism in the 70s and 80s or some versions of Christian nationalism now, being able to say, but we have a thus saith the Lord for what you're supposed to do. Mm. You're supposed to do this. And the other guys, they don't have an answer. Well, in, in this case, there, there isn't one right answer because of the factors we've yes. already talked. Christians are going to make different judgments. In different, what, what, what I want them to do is make those judgments informed under consciences that have been instructed yes. by the Word of God. And, and so that y you will have good people differ. People that have the same principles differ on how to navigate. I mean, I, you, you mentioned Rutherford. You know, one of the sad things about Scottish history at that period of time is the division between guys that are our heroes. We look back at how they totally broke off with one another over political decisions in their culture. Rutherford in some ways is looking back and lamenting how that happened. So that can happen. And uh, so again, as a pastor, I want to be careful about that. I, I may have a particular instinct on how I think something ought to be <laughs> approached. And I need to be really careful about saying, you have to do this. I want to make sure that person doesn't give away the store in terms of their commitments. Well, you know, I really shouldn't pray because if I pray, I'll get in trouble with the government. Uh, no, you should pray. Keep on praying, you know, or, you know, I, I should give up on this basic Christian doctrine because that doctrine is, is looked down upon. And it's, nope, you can't give up on that doctrine. Uh, but then how then do I advance public policy? How then do I engage on that issue? There are going to be a million judgment calls. That comes back to your prudential decision making. That, that has to be a part of democracy, yeah. right? Yeah, because true. so much of how we govern is it's, it's in a context of compromise. You, you have to figure out, can I, get, can I coalesce around a particular program to get enough votes to win a vote? Uh, you have to win in democracy in order to be able to govern. And, uh, and that means that people are, they can throw rocks. How could you have compromised with that? How could you have made alliances with them? You're a compromising, liver lily uh, coward. But if you, if you don't construct coalitions in a democracy, you can't govern. So it, it's messier in a democracy, I think. In some ways, it's cleaner when you're dealing with an evil dictator. Uh, but when we're the, we're the government, you have to build coalitions to operate in that democracy. I'm glad you mentioned uh, being careful as a pastor because many of us are in roles where people give a lot of deference to our yeah. perspective and we speak with a kind of divine authority on the basis of scripture. And people may give us a similar kind of deference in areas that are really outside of our calling or expertise, including political areas. So just recognizing that there are limits to our, our pastoral oversight and pastoral authority, and then emphasizing the things that, that really are important. And you mentioned prayer, which I, in a way, that's the easiest one of all of these, because it's such a clear calling that we have to pray for our leaders. I'm not sure even that, as simple and basic and clear as it is, is something that we really excel. But it should be mentioned in this conversation as one of the believer's responsibilities in the political sphere. Yeah, it's very powerful, too. First uh, Timothy 2, you know, I urge that prayers uh, be offered for kings, those in authority. And I think it takes the, the sinful heat out of some Christians that are very right. distressed right. at directions. It's like, pray for this individual. Um, pray for their transformation. If, if Nebuchadnezzar was speaking as a regenerate person at the end, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Maybe he, he was. God can convert anyone. God desires all people to be saved, First Timothy 2. It's connected there. I, I've seen people's 
countenances change when they start praying for people, elected officials they deeply disagree with. They start to realize, wait a minute, this is a human being that's going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. And then secondly, they're making choices that I disagree with. And, and then there's a shifting of their attitude. So. I'm mainly concerned that we don't, I'm always cautious myself, of baptizing Enlightenment liberalism and assuming that we are living at the moment in history where we've figured out the right political sure. arrangements. Sure. So I, the reason I actually like some of the conversations around politics is because it helps me step back and critique my own assumptions about how should, how should a society work. And I think I can so easily default to a sort of post-Enlightenment plural democracy that, you know, asking questions like, well, you know, should we instantiate public policy that, that um, favors Christianity in some way, right? I think that's an interesting question. I think there's lots of landmines around that question, but I think the question itself helps us actually uh, not be, you know, to use C.S. Lewis's term, not to be falling into chronological snobbery where, where it feels like yeah. we have figured this out and, you know, our politics has advanced to the moment in, in history where now we understand how to do it. So I, 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 I'm just trying to speak to your question from a few minutes ago, Phil, to say that I, I think there's good in robust conversations about this, f honoring freedom of conscience and honoring the fact that there's a lot of wisdom and prudence required to think about how do we move forward in questions of public policy. How are you going to encourage your people to engage politically? How, how, how do you want people that you are called to shepherd and encourage and edify what do you want to do to help cultivate a good and right and wise and biblical political engagement? One area for me is simply encouraging young people to be open to a calling in public service, including political office. Because I think even if you set aside a wrong kind of pursuit of power, um, trying to bring, the heaven, bring heaven to earth in ways that yeah. God has not given us as the church, there still is. Uh, a noble tradition of Christian engagement in the political sphere. And that's one place where we do need to live out our Christian calling. And Daniel's a great example of that. So that would be one thing, just encourage and openness is this is one place to serve God. And you don't, it doesn't have to be your full-time vocation either. There are lots of local opportunities, library board, parks commission. There are lots of places where Christians ought to be much more engaged and not think, oh, I, I only want to be involved in my church and in these ministry areas. This is another sphere of Christian witness. So those are two things that I think are important. Yeah, interesting also in Daniel 6, it's pretty clear um, that Darius loves Daniel. Uh, also that Daniel's extremely competent at what he does. And I look at some of the um, identity politics that put people in power that are inept. Right. They're just not good right. at governning. Right. And they we, run we get the leaders we deserve, yes. yeah. not the ones we need. Exactly. That's what I say. <laughs> so you get inept leaders who don't know how to run a big city. And when they're done, it's much worse in every respect. So I guess one way we engage is if you're going to do that, be good at governance. Yeah. Find out what a good government is in non-controversial ways. What, what, is a healthy, what does a healthy run city look like? What are the elements of good government so that you could see people that come through and they're just like Daniel was really good at their job because they looked for something they could find. And he was neither negligent nor inept. He's on it. He's yeah. excellent. We, the only thing we're going to find is with his religion, because other than that, he is just a phenomenal administrator is to see Christians do that kind of thing. That's good. I, I, I agree that all politics is local and so i'm encouraging my flock just to take responsibility for things like library boards and school boards and being active in the most local ways um, but i think also just trying to help christians care about loving their neighbor and care about the common good because i think actually there are many people in my city i want to be a champion for the flourishing of my city and whether it's uh, people involved in my church who are pursuing that or just my neighbors in the city i want to i want to say i want a well-run city that um, honors human flourishing and that makes life work for people and so i think uh, i want to lead a church where that's part of the thing we're aiming for, hoping for, praying for, and working yeah, for. Yeah, you could, you could circle back, like some of the DEI stuff and the education that's going on in LGBT is taking the place of the work that the school should be doing. Right. And so inevitably what's going to happen is performance is going to go down in these areas. I think it's good for Christians to say, hey, aside from all that, I mean, we want to talk about it, but aside from all that, how are the students actually doing? Are they competing well in reading, writing, arithmetic, other things? Are they or not? Because their time is being taken up with these other things. And, and those questions might win the day. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Enjoy the conversation, man. Thank you so Thank much. You.